Okay, we're back here live at Strata. This is SiliconAngle.com. This is our cube, our broadcast, where we go out to the events, talk to the smartest people we can find, and we don't care who they are. They could be entrepreneurs, they could work at Bank of America, they could be anywhere. Uh, as long as they have knowledge and, and they can extract a signal from the noise with us, we want to talk to them. My co-host is Dave Vellante, the uh, founder of Wikibon.org, our research team, putting out amazing, the first study on big data uh, in the history of the big data industry. Go to Wikibon.org org slash big data and you will find the market sizing and revenues by vendor in the big data space. This is a comprehensive report. Go there, check that out. This is our Cube and our first guest is a longtime Cube alumni, Abi Mehta, who is the founder of Trisada and uh, also was at Bank of America at the original Hadoop world, been with us at, at the Cube's present at creation in 2010 and launched his company here on the Cube our show. Exactly a year ago. A year ago yeah. here at Strata. Strata. Abi, welcome back. You coined the phrase, the industrial revolution, the data factories, <laughs> all is happening. All You're is a happening. visionary. You're predicting the future. You're an entrepreneur. Great guy. Well, thank you. One of our favorite guests. Welcome back. This is this is mutual love here. I love it. This is <laughs> great. Yeah, but great. I, I, yeah. our one year anniversary, guys, and we launched Traceda, and as you said, exactly here on Strata a year ago. And Boy, has Strata changed, uh, the cube has grown. Uh, Traceda has its pro product out in production with a client, so, and to your point, I think the predictions we had made and what seemed at the time bold statements are all coming true. When you have 2,000 people sit, sitting in a room talking to visionaries, I now call them revolutionaries, on what this uh, revolution can enable. It's, it's exciting, it's very exciting times. Yeah, well when we first met at Hadoop World uh, in 2010, I had been in Dallas, I got in the plane, left the storage networking world, it was the best thing I ever did. You know, <laughs> the big data's exploded. You could just feel from the vibe, and particularly from the interview we did with you, how real big data was and what it was going to mean in terms of the way it was going to change you know, so much of the, not only the IT industry, but society in general. That's correct, I, I, mean, I did a keynote today morning uh, talking about the power of the same thing because I think we, we are finally realizing uh, there's a dimension to data and data analysis that has a power uh, and a transform, transformative power to solve problems we literally couldn't solve before. And it's, it's something that people have said multiple times, but I think we are finally seeing that notion transcend from just the web to other industry verticals and tackle issues like healthcare or looking at the, uh, the real estate mess globally, right, which is a $14 trillion problem, and, and offer creative ideas, but also tangible solutions uh, at a scale that just literally wasn't possible before. So it's a, it's a very exciting time. So Avi, let me ask you a question. I want to drill down into an area because you've been a participant in the industry uh, at many levels, but also, also pioneering with your startup. So you're kind of wearing multiple hats, kind of pioneer, entrepreneur, business owner now, uh, and so on and so forth. But we were just talking earlier uh, today and, la and yesterday about the stages of the big data business. In mm -hmm. 2010 it was, hey, what is Hadoop? And you had guys like uh, alpha geeks like us saying, oh man, this is a vision. It's going to happen, it's the future, data factory. So th there was a conversation of one camp saying, man, there's some great stuff happening, we see the future, and then the other camp was like, what is Hadoop again? And so tw 2011 became, hey, this is big data industry, it's actually a bona fide business model. Right. Right, so you know, companies are being formed, Absolutely. investments taking place. 2012, we're seeing platform maturity mm -hmm. and a growth in applications. Absolutely. Dave and I were predicting 2013 being when it starts raining money, meaning value <laughs> to customers. Agree. Uh, do you agree with that? I absolutely. I mean, I, I, I use these terms for in a very similar terminology, and I'll answer the question in three short parts. First is, let's look at the eras, right? So 2011, and I'll break the eras in 12 months because eras are no longer decades. I call, I'm calling 2011 the year of validation and education. So every single big tech company we know and every single big non-tech company we know came out and, and acknowledged Hadoop, right? They all said, I'm in. I'm in, <laughs> exactly. I, I get it. This is no longer uh, a, a web-enabled or web-driven platform only for use for web data. They all came out and said, no, this is going to be a real transformational enterprise technology, which I think was big. I'm seeing 2012 as the year of scaled-up testing. So this is real testing, scaled up proof of concepts in every single industry vertical you can think of. That's 2012. 
And 2013. Scaled up proof of concept, just to kind of clarify that. Most people think of proof of concept as a little bit of test money. You're talking a little bit different. Uh, absolutely, good point. Bigger scale, talk about the scale of proof of concept. So, so it's a very good, very good question. I think there are two dimensions to it. First of all, the proof of concept is no longer around, let's build 10 nodes and test if I can install Hadoop, right? That, I, think we are beyond, I think we are beyond <laughs> that's that phase. A, that's not the, right. the, the proof of <laughs> concepts are more about, I know I have problems to solve that I cannot solve on existing technology stacks or technology tools. So can you help me apply in a proof of concept this new technology platform and show me what problems can I solve? So I can prove out the return on investment to make the big leap and re, completely re-architect the enterprise data stack around Hadoop. So I'm calling 2013. And the leap is the complete reconstruction of their business model. Complete reconstruction of the business model. I think, and I think a realization, also the complete reconstruction of the data infrastructure within an enterprise. I made a statement yeah. today morning, which is the data stack, as we knew it, has been completely commoditized. Right. The last remaining piece was data intelligence, right? What we, what we used to call BI. And that's now commoditized. It's so that means source. technology is no longer the constraint. Right? Technology is no longer the constraint, yeah. exactly. The point I made, mean, technology is no longer the constraint. So if technology is no longer the constraint, and you have petabytes of data, and you have problems that need intelligence at a, a very granular function to do bottoms up analysis, not top down, to solve problems that could range from the sp uh, understanding the spread of disease to understanding how you price your credit cards, it can now be done. So I think 2013, we will see, to, uh, to, to, make, to reinstate your point, uh, re-emphasize your point, 2013 will be the year where we will see entire data infrastructures being built around Hadoop in industry verticals that we hitherto would have thought would not have done it. So let me ask you, let me ask you a so question. A lot of money pouring in. Yeah, I think I do agree. I think it's <laughs> well. Rain, raining money means it's, you start to see the real value Correct. of the dollars. Um, we were talking earlier about the role of virtualization plays and flash is playing in the construction of database, mm -hmm. the, the gear that powers the, the big data. Um, Dave and I were commenting about VMware's lack of big data strategy. Um, do you have any perspective on that? Because they have yet to come out with their big data strategy and Essentially, there's a lot of things they could do with it, with data layers. So the data layer is commoditized, but where does it fit? So closer to the server, we're seeing with Flash, yeah. certainly um, you can put it closer to the server. So virtualization, VMware owns the enterprise. Flash is now making a massive inroad with Fusion IO and others Correct. in the enterprise. Where's, big, where's the big data stretch from VMware? Yeah. What, do you have a perspective on that? Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll make it a lot, slightly broader than VMware specifically. I, I'm not... Uh, the virtualization players. Yeah, but, so virtualization That's players. Like, in so I think the, the biggest... I don't think the best kept, but the biggest secret of the world of big data that people don't talk enough about, and we are very passionate about, is the fact that there really is not an analytics cloud in the market. So when we go to our customers, if you want to be able to do analytics at scale, big, deep data processing, and then deep analytics in the cloud, you cannot do that. Because think of it, right? You look at it in Amazon, and this is deep respect for what Amazon's done, but I can't put a petabyte of data on S3 and then move it to Elastic yeah. MapReduce to process it. Right? And, the then got I, and then you got I.O. problems and too. You got I.O. problems, yeah. which goes to the second point. You cannot charge customers by I.O. in the world of big data analytics. Because that's like giving somebody a beautiful, one. yeah, yeah. It's like putting some, a, a great lunch buffet in front of you Bring and your trying your hands yeah. in the back and yeah. saying, you know what? Only if you pay me for that, yeah. Feed, yeah. that food item and that food item separately, I'll let you taste it. So, you can't, so there is a massive gap <laughs> virtualization, virtualization as a larger industry, there's a massive gap in the market of being able to do what we are now calling big data as a service. The infrastructure part of that big data as a service is a massive hole. So I tell every single VC I meet, if you find a company that can enable you to do analytics in a virtualized fashion, not in a virtualized architecture, virtualized fashion, but allowing you to leverage it with data as local, invest in them because that is a massive hole in the market. So that's okay. one. I think on the second part though, because I've, I've always said this, big tech, the only way big tech innovates is by buying companies, right? Innovation means how big of a checkbook do you have, right? So I think there is, we, I'm calling it, the next, we're seeing a Darwinian revolution for big tech. And it's going to last in the next, for the next 50 years. But I think the next five years, we will see a incredible amount of M&A frenzy in this space where finally the action, and I think the three of us were early in this in calling it, the action is squarely going to be in the application tier, not in the infrastructure tier because it's commoditized, mm -hmm. and we will see an incredible frenzy of M&A amongst the big tech guys to get there. So I think, can VMware figure out a path to leveraging the big data trend to re-energize the business? 
I think it's going to rest on how smart of an M&A guy or, or team they have to figure yeah. it out for them. Well, it's such a great uh, use Paul of Moritz cash, is definitely know. smart enough, sure, but the question is speed. And so they bought Spring uh, Source, obviously at that point, arguably a big number, looking good right now with the framework growth. They have a huge hole, and they had to fill that. So I don't think Agreed. VMware can figure it out. Personally, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. So, I mean, that's your opinion as well. Maybe I, they'll buy Cloudera. Yeah, exactly. You know, a lot of guys from VMware left VMware to go to Cloudera. I actually did not know that. That's an yeah, interesting yeah. insight. You know, yeah. you, Eli Collins is at VMware. I, I like you, John, because you make bold predictions, and life is short. <laughs> you got to make bold predictions. <laughs> I'm my so, own boss. No one can fire me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the beauty of being an entrepreneur, yeah, right? Mendel Rosenblum and also Diane Green yeah, are no, investors absolutely. in good Cloudera. Point. Yeah, good, you very good point. a lot of DNA from the virtualization space. Right. Amar Awadala did a virtual, uh, PhD in virtualization under, under Mendel. So, you know, there's a lot of similarities right. in culture there around big data and virtualization. I, I think it's an inter interesting point. And and I, I'm going to make, th this is as far as I'll venture in my thought, which is the industry today, in the world of big data, being the fact that we play in the application tier, and we certify our platform in every single flavor of Apache, which I can tell you is not very different, and the performance, nothing's different, right? It's a different branding, and a, uh, I think it's unclear, and it's important for the market, there needs to be a clear winner in the short, if, if Hadoop is to be, and hold the promise it has, which is to be the data platform for the future. It is in all of our best interests to coalesce around one player who can be the red hat of the... Of Cer certainty, get certainty into get the... Certainty to take that risk out of the equation. That's exactly right, because I think it's becoming very... The, the Hadoop, and you've heard me say that, Hadoop was always enterprise ready. But as we are now transitioning into use cases and business use cases with our clients, the clients are, are going to start driving what the open source community needs to build. And I can tell you, I can tell you with 100% confidence today, what's on the roadmap is not what the clients are asking for. And I think that needs to very quickly coalesce around making sure that making Hadoop scale to be the enterprise data platform needs things to be fixed that the enterprise needs to inform. But it's not happening right, not, now. Yeah, it's it's not happening right now. It's Darwinian, so, right? I mean, it's you not, got, it's so, so, Abhi, because we make bold predictions and you also make bold comments <laughs> that turn out to be true. We both are geniuses, I guess, uh, self-promotion each other. If you're a VC, um, and you're, say, uh, Frank Artali at Ignition right. or Ping Lee at Excel, two of the smartest VCs I know uh, in the business in big data. Um, you know, Mike Olson talks about application surge. Uh, you guys are doing some good work there. Right. If you're a VC, if we're a VC partnership, three of us, right. what, inv what investments would we make on the application side? What would we look for? So obviously, as applications come out, which right. ones are fundable? Because there's a lot of apps that are lifestyle businesses. You have right. SaaS is really easy to deploy. Right. You could have essentially ISVs, data ISVs, all kinds of new nuances of business models. Um, but we're VCs, we want to right. invest in big wins. Right. What are the big apps? What would we have to look for? So I think it's, a, I'll, I'll take Trusita as an example, because I think it's, it's close to my heart, but it's a, it's a model that's now worked in the market because we're now in production live with the clients. Uh, I think there are three key requirements for an app, a big data app, to be successful. Number one, you have to, you have to understand that big data has two core pieces. There's the data processing end and the deep analytics end. And if an application only does one and not the other, I would not invest in it. Because the reality is you can't do deep analytics unless the data has been processed, right? So you've got to be able to find a analytical platform that can do both those things. That's number one. But number two, you've got to be able to identify and build your application platform to be API ready. So because here's the reality of it. No matter how, many re how much resources collectively we as VCs may invest, or I as Trisata may invest, the application ecosystem will always outrun and outpace the application platform. So you've got to make sure that what, as you're writing the platform, it's API ready to enable the SIs, to enable the other players to write their own applications on top of it. That's point number two. And point number three, and again, we've been bold on this prediction earlier, but I think we're seeing it happen as we speak. We will absolutely see the verticalization of applications and analytics around data types. So for financial data, there is only one player in the market. It's called Trusera, which you guys love, right? Yeah. And you'll see, some, you'll see similar uh, coalescing of analytical platforms around other data types. And, and I've, I've changed that slightly from ver industry verticals. So I think the way we define industry verticals has to change. We have to think more of data verticals and industry verticals. Because guess what? Retailers, and we've been getting tons of inbound calls given our application from retailers, and we used to scratch our head and go, why? 
I'm a, I'm a big data for banking company, right? And the reality is 80% of all data in a retailer is financial data. The problem they're trying to solve is what my application solves, total view of customer. So we have changed our, but I think those are the three things that we would watch out for on the big data analytics side from an application perspective. Great. So thou shalt, yeah, thou, totally does, totally thou does. shalt not just process, you, thou shalt do deep analytics, thou shalt do the API. Or vice versa. Or, or thou vice shalt vice not vice only right, do right, deep right. analytics, but thou shalt also and, data process. And, and then thou shalt go vertical. Okay, talk about, uh, okay. let's talk about something, uh, you talked about, I asked the VMware question, you kind of made a little broader about virtualization. Yeah. So let me ask you about um, Hadoop and versus other platforms like Cassandra and this new open source project we're seeing it, even on the I.O. side, Dave and I are talking about Node.js being fundamentally on the I.O. side. So you've got a lot of different pieces to the puzzle. Correct. Okay, so talk about how you're seeing those evolve. So I think I have actually a very simple answer to that one. I call it the HDFS ecosystem, not the Hadoop ecosystem. And if you're not on the HDFS ecosystem, good luck. So we are a company completely built on the HDFS ecosystem. I think the HDFS ecosystem will evolve very rapidly to address pretty much every single analytical process you would like to run, including, and, I, and including things like real-time and streaming. We actually already en enable real-time analytics on our platform. Uh, streaming is an app that will absolutely get built as a horizontal application on top of HDFS ecosystem. So I think, as far as we are concerned, the way we look at the market, the HDFS ecosystem is the winner. The HDFS ecosystem will be the data platform for the future. And while, let's take the example you use, while, while I love Cassandra for some specific things it can do, the thing I do not like about Cassandra and what they did was write their own file system. So if Cassandra had actually leveraged the HDFS file system, it would have been great. Here's why I say that. We're seeing these interesting tools develop, but they're breaking the golden principle of big data. They're asking you to duplicate the data, which is a massive problem. So let's take a great example, Lucene. We are big believers in the next phase, if you were to ask me the question differently, what would be the next two or three projects we believe are going to be massive in the world of big data? We are big believers that text-based search on top of deep analytics is going to be the killer app, which immediately takes your mind to Lucene. But here's what I don't like about Lucene. In Lucene today, in Lucene and Solar, I got to duplicate the data. I'm not going to do that. I mean, I'm just literally, I refuse to do that, right? So I think same thing goes for R. We are massive believers in R. But in R today, R does not work on HDFS. R works on a very small implementation of HDFS, and Revolution will tell you that. So we're working with Revolution to actually make R work at scale in the HDFS ecosystem. So I think as, if the newer things are not being built in the HDFS ecosystem, good luck. So ripping out HDFS and dropping in Cassandra doesn't do it for you. That's just, you feel like the wrong approach. Exactly right. Cassandra, if it worked natively on HDFS, would have been a lot more powerful. I think would have seen a lot more adoption in the market as well. And a lot of talk about machine learning at this event. Um, yeah. Talk about that a little bit. So I think machine learning has two dimensions. And I'll break it back to the dimensions that we mentioned. There's a data processing side of machine learning and then the deep analytics side of machine learning. I think we all get enamored with when we hear the word machine learning and we jump into the deep analytics, right? Because it's sexier. Sure, right. But I think, and we are a great example of it, Trusita has written as many, as many proprietary algorithms in machine learning on data processing, probably more, as we have on deep analytics. Because here's, here's, here's the problem and here's the power. The ability to actually take massive amounts of data, both structured and unstructured, and then have it available for analytics, which is a massive processing job, right? You've got to ingest it, clean it, dedupe it, merge it, parse it, then rerun it, then run the analytics on it, is a machine learning problem. And the way you address those issues, especially when you bring in structure and structure together, which is another big cow I have. I, I don't agree with this concept of do structure and relational and do unstructured and Hadoop. That's bullshit. Unify them. You've got to unify yeah. the two because structure by itself, interesting. We've been doing it for 50 years and we have still have massive problems to solve. Unstructured by itself, uh, yeah, kind of interesting. Hmm. Bring the two together, killer. Transform, yeah. or killer. Transformative, right? Okay, so I, I want to ask you about HBase. Obviously, right. we'll be at HBase conference. We we run HBase. Obviously, right. HDFS. You talked about the killer file system. So, um, what's your view on HBase? How do you feel about it? The growth of HBase, their challenges and opportunities. What do you think about it? So, I think HBase is uh, is a is a part of the HDFS ecosystem, a platform we love. So, I think HBase becomes over time, and and I think the the techies will hate for me saying it, but I'll say it anyway because it's a business perspective. I think HBase becomes the database on, on HDFS, long term. From a perspective of What's what- What's wrong with that? I, no, 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 techies don't like that. For some reason, techies don't like that. No. But I think so, big believers in HBase- Yeah, because you're forcing it on them. Sounds good to me. Because you're forcing it on them. Because I'm forcing it on them, that's yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> but, but I think long term, 
HBase becomes a massive disruptor in the kind of functionality users are expecting from a database, you can expect from HBase. And it's going to be incredibly powerful, especially for um, solutions or use cases where you want very, very quick, random uh, write and read, with the, which there is no better solution for it. So HBase is going to be a massive yeah, yeah. winner. We, we use HBase a lot internally. You're using it? We use HBase yeah, a lot so, internally. So do we. Uh, so do you. Yeah, perfect. So I think HBase is uh, definitely one of the winners. It's got some work. What about the challenges? Where do they need to improve HBase? I mean, obviously, it's not really mainstream enough for them. In my mind, mainstream developers, right. you still got to be pretty strong CS dude to hack Correct. with HBase. But, you know, what do you see as the opportunities, so the challenges? I, I think I have a different perspective on it. I think because the HDFS ecosystem is an open source ecosystem, we should not expect the open source community to solve all the problems, because they won't, mm -hmm. right? Because a smart geek or a smart quant will do what he wants to do. And we should let them do that, because that is the very spur of big innovation. But I think you will see companies like ours, or Vibidata, innovate around the so-called imp imperfect pieces of open source technology and make it more user friendly. Or, may, or, have, or build the bells and whistles you need to make it effective in the vertical you choose. So I think, slightly biased because I'm in the business yeah. of setting my own platform, <laughs> but I think you would see HBase, yeah. HBase, is, HBase works today, it's got its quirk, but it works today. And I think you would see things, companies around uh, the open source ecosystem making it more user friendly. Okay, so I have to ask you about um, some things that you've mentioned two years ago in theCUBE about data factories. Um, and how disruptive that will be. Right. Um, we just had on the cube earlier the Met Metropolitan Chicago Information Center, right. Virginia Carlson, the president, who's solving a lot of problems as a nonprofit. They use data to solve, try to use big data to solve problems around healthcare deployment for you know federally funded yeah. people. So you know, you're, in your keynote today, you talked about big data and socioeconomical issues. Um, the question that we are exploring on that kind of impact of society question is. Um, people hoarding their data. <laughs> so um, we also heard Tim Estes from Digital Reasoning, who we love, right. talk about he doesn't trust Facebook. So people c commercially are trying to grab all the consumer data to sell it to back to the companies uh, for fees. Tim was worse, actually. He said he trusts the government more than he, he trusts trust Facebook. That's, that's, that's Tim Estes. Tim Estes. Oh my God, wow. that yeah. says it all. Yeah, no, that's how <laughs> that's scary. effed up Facebook is right now. And I said, how about Google Plus? He says, are you kidding me? So I guess that's ranked wow. slower than Facebook. Um, and by the way, Facebook's all ex-Google, so again, right. you see where the DNA is. Anyway, I get distracted. Um, <laughs> you guys have data, but you're a privately held company. So where are we with this notion of opening up the data so that um, combining private data and government data together, if we're going to have data factories and have an industrial revolution-like impact, right. where do we need to be with data? We talked about the tech and getting the, the weeds on the tech. Let's talk about right. a little, you know, uh, the, the society level. Where do we need to be mindset-wise and policy-wise with data? So I think, uh, great, f first of all, great question. And probably a trillion dollar question because I don't think there's a good answer to it. But I'll give you my perspective on it. I think we need to, as an industry, and I mentioned this to Jeff Kelly, who is a phenomenal contributor on uh, Wikibon and someone I respect a lot. I mentioned this to Jeff as well. We need to, as an industry, stop belittling data. Data is an important asset. It also is sometimes a very private asset. <laughs> Mm. And we need to understand and recognize that. The conversation we are not having, that Truseda is taking the lead, just given the industry vertical we are on, is around data privacy. And that has to get addressed, John, to answer, that, answer your question in a complete way. So I think there needs to be a conversation around data privacy, data identity, and data ownership before it becomes clear what data can be used for what problem in what format in what way okay. and who benefits from it okay so that's the so, whole key yeah, so who benefits so, from it so right? it's a so. good good escape clause of answering the question because of i've been on record two years ago the data factories but let me bring to what we think is the hottest trend right, right. now that's uh, in the industry is identity and trust correct so apply identity and trust to data right so that's going to be a big component in the Completely privacy great. question Completely so great. what's your perspective on so, identity so, so and no trust? escape clause but i was going to answer the question i'm just busting your yeah. <laughs> so so i think data is is there is no choice for us there are two massive trends that are coalescing right and 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 i hate to use both those terms because they've now suddenly gone from sexy to just being overused but cloud and big data i think cloud is no longer a question on if the cloud happens. The cloud will absolutely happen. So the question has become, when does the cloud happen, right? Which in turn drives the conversation around data factories, some kind of data factories, because if the cloud happens, 
right? Sorry, when the cloud happens, the data is going to sit outside your own, what, what you thought were your own four walls. Is that necessarily bad? The answer is no. Probably data is more secure with a company that is in the business of managing data, Maybe. processing data, probably, it, right? It, probably, it right? depends. On yeah, yeah, processing yeah. data, yeah. then in a company that's core competence is banking or healthcare. Oh, oh yeah, oh, right? oh, in the cloud. Oh, in yeah, cloud, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you were saying the reverse. No, oh, no, yeah, cloud, right? I, I totally that's agree. That's their yeah. core competence, right? right? So that's the first it's thing. It's a differentiator for those guys. Yeah, absolutely. They're going right? to invest so, in so, it. I mean. So, so and, and, and the thing that the cloud has been missing, and being from our industry, everybody hears the way, hates the word cloud, and they shut the doors and windows when the clouds appear, right? Yeah. But leaving that aside, leaving that aside, I think data, big data becomes a trend that makes the cloud enterprise ready. And when that happens, to answer your question specifically, I think we'll have no choice but to live in an ubiquitous data world where data, by its very nature and definition, is open and allows for innovation to solve some white hat problems. So what is missing? What is missing is the cloud infrastructure. What is missing is, and some of it is just timing, what is missing is the applications, the white hat applications. No one has come to me, and I mentioned this to Jeff again thing, we need to think big, we need to dream big about big data. I love coming over here because you guys force me to dream big about big data. Where are the conversations where people are sitting around and saying, if I combine Facebook data with Google web data, with GPS information, I can eliminate fraud in the financial system. Who is having that conversation? You are. Nobody. You are. Yeah. You right? Are. So, so well, I you think, guys are solving that problem. That's correct. So I think, I think we need to identify two or three white hat, big ticket items, put them on the board and say, if we had data ubiquity, open data access, I can solve massive trillion dollar problems. And I think you will see when that happens, the government, because the government will be, whether we like it or not, the government will be involved, yeah. as they should be. You will see private enterprise and you'll see startups coalesce around this notion of data ubiquity, data openness, and go after it. And okay, that's so the I privacy, the, 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 pri the privacy issue, the problem is not just a public policy issue, it's a platform, suppliers, absolutely. it's all those because you know, if the government uh, uh, comes stakeholders. Absolutely, because if the government comes to three of us and said, okay guys, I want it to be open, can you manage security, privacy, can you manage user provisioning and access? The answer is, well, not really, yeah. I would Kinda. love to, yeah. but not yet, yeah. right? Yeah. And, then, and then I think yes. there's, uh, there's someone yes. you need to bring to yeah. the cube that I, I promise I'll bring next time, is a guy called Sandy Pentland, he's a, he's a partner and Chief Privacy Officer at Traceta. And he laid out a thing called the New Deal on Data to answer your question. Is it published or is it's it? Published. Okay, so it's published, it's published, it's at Davos. It, let's get it republished on SiliconANGLE. Perfect. And we'll do that and get him on the cube. Um, so I love chatting with you because we can be philosophical, we can also talk about tech and, and cool stuff. You're, you're one smart cube alum and we're, we're psyched to have you on. But I want to ask you now a philosophical question that's a little bit, little bit more kind of getting the clouds. So big data is a disruptive marketplace, obviously, and it's, it's like we're all climbing the mountain and when we get to the top of the mountain, whoever gets there first can look at the vista and see the valley of opportunities, wealth, creation, right. benefits to society. If at the top of that mountain you look down on that valley of opportunity, what do you see and what do you go after first? If you're an entrepreneur or, or yourself, I mean, what's your perspective? I mean, new opportunities are emerging around big data that rival the PC industry back, back in the late 70s, early 80s. So this is going to be a massive shift. What are that, what's that flourishing land look like for you? Know, it's for a, you? The, the flourishing land is massive. I, I mean, you guys wrote a great report, by the way, which I enjoyed reading. And uh, I think putting a number out there is important for the industry. Big data is not a fifty billion dollar market. <laughs> it's probably a fifty trillion dollar yeah, market. It's much bigger, right? Because agree. it's it's gonna it's, it's gonna reshape and resize to right. answer your question. It's, you're not even gonna be able to meadows. count it, right? You I mean you're not even it. gonna be able to count because, it. Because because the, uh, the amount of innovation a platform like Traceta can enable for a bank to re literally rebuild the banking system on, what is the number of that? Fifty trillion dollars, right? That's the the mortgage market is fourteen trillion. So I think I have, I have a very Dave, simple... go back to the drawing board and <laughs> your market sizing. But, but I, have a, I have a very simple rule to look at the opportunity or, or visualize the meta. And it is every, the, the, the successful companies of the future are not going to worry about the tools, are not going to worry about the widgets, are not going to worry about real time versus batch. They're only going to worry about one problem. What business problems can we solve that we could not solve before? Hmm. And whoever is coming to you and has told you that they have found the business problem, whether it's in healthcare, in retail, in telecom, in the web, in social, or in financial services, 
that meta, sky is the limit. Because I think not only will you see people like us making money in M&A, I think you will see the birth of the next generation technology data companies where the line between technology, data, and business is completely blurred. It's one vast ocean and the opportunity is truly limitless. So that's, that's that one simple rule. What business problem are you going to solve? Okay, so I need to kind of go the next step, which is for sure, I, I think it's massive. I'm excited by it. And I'm, just, I'm not just saying that to pump up the marketplace. I think we are seeing predictive and real-time analytics right. and data being a big part that no one ever had that conversation in data warehousing and, and right. business intelligence in the past. It's and the very, lines are so it's blurred. It's very historical. Exactly. The business the technology, what is and what isn't. I mean, it's all big data. That's right. So, yeah. so the, I guess my question then is about the new user experience. So assuming it's a $50 trillion market or more, right. <laughs> hundreds of trillions <laughs> of dollars, big data will enable. What is the user experience going to be like? Um, we had, again, we had the folks from Digital Reasoning on talking about, we use our mobile phone because the, the, the data management's not that good, so you got to be connected to the data all the time. And that new filters are going to come along. So all these new stuff, you can and dream up the future. What is the expectation of these users going to be? Great point. What is your vision and perspective on the user experience? Great point. Uh, the environment, the UI, the real life experience, what's your perspective? So, so here's the, uh, the second, uh, actually dark secret in big data. Big data does not take the human element away from decision making, which is going to answer your question. I believe, and so on our, on our platform, to use Trisita's big data platform, you don't need to learn MapReduce. You actually don't even need to know how to, um, how to use Excel sheets. You press buttons. So we believe that the, the, two way, the, the way we break out the market, data processing with deep analytics, will be fully automated, right? That pipe, those pipelines will absolutely be fully automated because you finally can using artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the new expressive power of MapReduce and, and HDFS automate those two pipelines. The user experience in that case, John, very simply becomes a business user. A u and, I, and here's how I define the business user. A user who is in touch with the direct end customer. So it could be anybody. It could be a teller at a branch, it could be a checkout lady at the, at the store, or it could be the person selling your cell phone at the AT&T store, right? That person has ubiquitous, real-time access, not to data, but to insight, in a user-friendly way where all you have to do, like on the iPhone, is swipe something, touch something, see what the information is, and make a decision. So I think the user experience becomes extremely, extremely uh, centric, uh, as, uh, looking more like the consumer apps, rather than the enterprise apps, may you need the act of God and 5,000 engineers to write a report, and it takes six months. I think that completely disappears. I think you'll see a massive consumerization of the user experience. If you, if you actually want to show you our platform, our platform has something called tiles. The tiles are, are codified by business problem. And literally, all you have to do to make it use is press a button. And when you don't like, or you have to change the cycle, you move some Lego blocks around, and voila, you can solve another business problem. So I think you will see people like you and me spending a lot more time accessing the information and making the better decisions for their customers in a consumer-like way from the user experience rather than worrying about writing SQL code. So pushing that decision-making way out into a distributed out fashion. The and, 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 exactly and, right. and then still, you need the human to do the last, maybe it's 100 feet, maybe it's not the last mile. That's but exactly right. Yeah. Okay, Abhi, you, uh, CUBE alumni, you've been on, uh, a regular contributor now, I guess, on the CUBE. Uh, great perspective. Uh, now CEO and, and founder of your own company, um, Visionary. Thank you so much well, for you. your perspective. As usual, great segment. Numbers are up. We can know when content's good. People start to, <laughs> the counter goes up. So I think you're also looking. <laughs> I mean, the biggest thing I noticed the change in Strata. The first time I spoke here last year, there was no makeup. <laughs> this time they put me down and powdered me down before I went for my keynote. So <laughs> I think that's a, that's a sign of You're success. You're one handsome man, I got to say. <laughs> Thank you, ladies out there. Yeah. Don't make up on the cube, not yet. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. John, always a pleasure. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you so much.